The Cross and the Crescent Part 1 Preface As recently as the late 19th century, it was not uncommon to find Christian men and women prefacing a book by invoking the name of God. Today, that is a rare occurrence and often the cause of a raised eyebrow in what is becoming an increasingly secular world. Within Christianity, such a formal invocation of the name of God has become anachronistic and out of fashion. In contrast, most publications by Muslim writers commence with the invocation, Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, which reads in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. As such, one still finds within the Muslim world the continuation of a practice that was formerly quite common within the Christian world. Similarly, in days gone by, Christians frequently interspersed a statement of their intentions or of their predictions by saying, God willing. This served as an acknowledgement by Christian men and women that, in the final analysis, their intentions and predictions would be fulfilled only with the grace of God. Such Christian verbiage is now considered a relic of the past. However, Muslim men and women still constantly pepper their statements with the phrase insha, Allah, meaning, God willing. This manner of invoking the name of God, and of acknowledging the sovereignty of the Almighty God in all that we do and plan, serves to highlight the central tenet of this collection of essays which draws close parallels between Islam and Christianity. Further, as one investigates historical Christianity and gets closer to the roots of Christianity, that shared commonality and the interrelationship between Islam and Christianity become ever stronger and more pronounced unfortunately. This close interrelationship between these two religions is often overlooked. For many Occidental Christians, Islam is seen as being decidedly foreign, as being the religion of another place and of a foreign people, i.e., Arabia and the Arabs. In reality, this perception is far from being accurate Islam, no less than Christianity, claims to be a universal religion, which cannot be appropriated by any national or ethnic group nor by any geographic area. Arabs represent only a minority of the world's Muslims and Islam has spread far beyond the borders of the Middle East. Moreover, at present, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States, having approximately 7 million adherents. Clearly, the need for mutual understanding and appreciation between Christians and Muslims becomes ever more imperative. Unfortunately, for most Western Christians, differences in language and in certain literary conventions add to the perceived foreign nature of Islam. As one example, Western Christians are used to the word God and typically find the word Allah somewhat mysterious and troubling. They do not understand that Allah is nothing more than the contraction of two Arabic words which mean the God or by implication the one God. As such, it is not surprising that Arab Christians commonly use the word Allah when speaking of the deity. As a second example, Western Christians are often uneasy about the Islamic convention of conferring the phrase, peace be upon him to the names of the prophets of Allah. Yet, a third example finds Muslims typically objecting to the use of such dating conventions as B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno's Domini, i.e., in the year of our Lord. Since they maintain that none other than Allah is Lord. Obviously, such linguistic sensitivities need to be overcome. In order for Christians and Muslims to develop a proper appreciation of the commonality between their religions. Having said the above, I find it useful to introduce the author to the reader so that he may have some understanding of his qualifications to discuss the issues at hand. He holds a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School and was formerly an ordained minister, deacon in the United Methodist Church. His personal experience of the interrelationships between Christianity and Islam and their common roots covers a journey of many years that has evolved in depth and breadth with time. It began almost 30 years ago in a course at Harvard on comparative religion. It developed further during the last two decades as he studied the history of the Arabian horse and grew to fruition as he started moving within the Muslim communities in America and in the Middle East. The Cross and the Crescent the first essay in the book is a simple recounting of the author personal experience of the commonality to be found between Christianity and Islam, and is entitled Parallels Between Christianity and Islam. Its targeted readership includes both Muslims and Christians, but for each group a separate message has been intended. The second essay, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Origins and Relationships seeks to resolve certain barriers to communication existing among members of these three religious groups. In that regard, Muslims may better understand the conceptual and communication barriers which separate Christians and Jews from them. While Christians and Jews may appreciate those conceptual and communication barriers separating Muslims from them. The third essay presents a comparison and analysis of the structure and provenance of the Quran, the received Torah, the Psalms and the canonical Gospels of the New Testament. 
This essay presents some fairly technical information which sheds significant light on the formation of these sets of scripture and thus illuminates some aspects of the origins of Judaism. Christianity and Islam not covered in the prior essay. The next five essays focus on specific topics in the Judeo-Christian tradition. These essays contain a great deal of information regarding the basic foundations of Christianity and how they relate to Islam. To a great extent, this consists of information not known to the Christian lady, but information that is known to the better educated of their clergy. The primary reason behind writing these essays is to educate Christians about the origins and foundations of their own religion in the hope that this may lead them to appreciate the heritage which they so closely share with Islam. Additionally, Muslims may gain a much better appreciation of just how similar certain branches of early Christianity were to the teachings of Islam. The last essay. A concise introduction to Islam. Articles of Faith and Pillars of Practice is an introduction to Islam for the Christian reader. In that respect, I have attempted to bridge the Judeo-Christian tradition and Islam wherever possible. In order to help the Christian reader gain a better understanding of Islam and of its similarity to his or her own religious tradition. As such, this introduction to Islam approaches certain issues from a slightly different perspective than do most such presentations on Islam. In conclusion, while this final essay was written primarily for the Christian reader, it's the author's sincere desire that the Muslim reader may also find it worthwhile reading. Parallels between Christianity and Islam Academic encounters with Islam Familiar names In pursuing his decision to enter the ministry, the author attempted to receive the best education that he could. Thanks to Allah once again, he was lucky to be admitted to Harvard College, Harvard University, on scholarship. During his freshman year, he enrolled in a two-semester course in comparative religion, which was taught by Wilfred Cantwell Smith, whose specific area of expertise was Islam. He says, as I began my study of Islam, I was surprised more than ever before to learn how similar Islam was in so many aspects to my own Christianity. Certainly, the religious history and heritage of the two religions seemed similar, if not nearly identical. After all, my initial reading of the Quran revealed numerous references to Adam. Noah, Abraham, Ismael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Solomon, John the Baptist, and Jesus. Peace be upon them. In fact, those of the Judeo-Christian tradition may be surprised to learn that the Quran specifically names many biblical figures far more often than it refers to Muhammad by name. In that regard, using Abdullah Yusuf, Ali's English translation of the meaning of the Holy Quran, And counting the number of times a name is cited in the text, the author found that Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Solomon, and Jesus are all mentioned far more frequently than are parallel stories in the Quran and the Bible. In reading the Quran, the author quickly discovered that the similarities between the Quran and the Bible, Islam, and the Judeo Christian tradition are not limited to the use of names of prominent biblical characters. Alone. Within the pages of the Quran, the author found many stories that are an impressive parallel to those recorded in the Bible. Occasionally, the stories in the Quran offer a slightly different perspective and detail from the parallel ones in the Bible. However, the overall similarity is impressive, as is shown in the following few examples The creation and fall of Adam. Both the Bible and the Quran address the issue of the creation of the first man, Adam, and of his subsequent expulsion from the Garden of Eden. The biblical narration is recorded in Genesis 2.4-3.24 and details that Adam was created from the dust of the ground. And Allah breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being and was asked to give names to every animal. Eve, Adam's wife, was formed by Allah from one of Adam's ribs. Allah then declared that the two were free to eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, barring one particular tree Satan, in the guise of a serpent, persuaded Eve, who in turn persuaded Adam to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree, disobeying the command of their Creator. Thereupon, their nakedness became manifest to them and they were ashamed of it. In punishment of their disobedience, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. In a distinct similarity of description, the Quran the author says draws a close parallel to this instance. O Messenger, remember when Allah said to the angels and Iblis, who was with them, I will create a being from dried clay that rings when it is hit, it is black and of an altered scent. If I fashion his image and perfect his creation then prostrate to him in obedience to my command and to greet him. 
The angels obeyed, so they all prostrated as their Lord commanded them. As for Iblis, who was with the angels but was not one himself, refused to prostrate to Adam along with the angels. After Iblis refused to prostrate to Adam, Allah said to him, What kept you and prevented you from prostrating with the angels, who prostrated out of obedience to my command? Iblis arrogantly said, It is not proper for me to prostrate to a being you created out of dried clay that used to be black, malleable clay. Allah said to Iblis, Exit from paradise, for you are banished. Upon you is my damnation, and banished you are from my mercy until the day of judgment. Iblis said, O Lord, allow me to live and do not cause me to die until the day that Adam and his offspring are resurrected. Allah, the exalted, said, You are of those who I will grant a long life. Until the time when all created things will die, upon the first blow of the horn. Iblis said, O Lord, because you misguided me, I will make sins on earth seem attractive to them, and I will lead them all astray from the straight path. Except for those servants you select to be worshipful to you. Allah said, This is a straight path that leads to me. You have no power or sway over tempting my sincere servants, except for those who follow you who are led astray. Hellfire is the promised abode of Iblis and all those who follow him who have been led astray. Hellfire has seven doors through which they enter. For each of its doors, there is a known amount of the followers of Iblis who will enter through it. Those who are mindful of Allah, by obeying his command and staying away from disobedience will have gardens and springs. When they enter, it will be said to them, enter it with safety from any misfortune and security from any fears. I removed what was in the chests of enmity and envy. They are brethren beloved to one another, sitting upon thrones and looked upon one another. Fatigue does not affect them, and they will not be made to leave it. Rather, they will remain in it forever. O Messenger, inform my servants that I am the forgiving towards whomever of them repents, and I am merciful to them. And inform them that my punishment is the severe punishment, so they should repent to me so they can receive my forgiveness and be safe from my punishment. al Hijah 28-50 Allah tells his prophet and humankind that he said to the angels that he would put humans on earth who will give birth to other humans, to inhabit it according to his laws. The angels asked their Lord, trying to understand, what the wisdom behind making the children of Adam guardians of the earth was, when they would ruin things in it, and kill in it. While the angels always do as he tells them, and recognize his greatness, praising him and honoring his power and perfection. Allah replied to their question, saying that he knew the deep wisdom behind his creation of them, and behind making them guardians, and the angels did not. To reveal the position of Adam, Allah taught him the names of everything, living things and objects, their pronunciation and meanings. Then he put them before the angels, instructing them to tell him the names if they were telling the truth when they said that they were a nobler and better creation than Adam. Recognizing their shortcomings and that everything comes from Allah, they said that they acknowledged that his judgment and sacred law could not be doubted. And that they had no knowledge except for the knowledge he had given them, accepting that he is the knowing, from whom nothing is hidden, and the wise in his decrees and laws. Then Allah told Adam to tell them the names. When Adam told the angels the names of things, as he had been taught, Allah reminded the angels that he had told them that he knew everything hidden in the heavens and the earth. And what they made public and what they said inside of themselves. Allah reveals that he told the angels to prostrate to Adam out of recognition and respect, so they prostrated to him, eager to do as he told them, except for Iblis or Satan, who was originally from the jinn. Due to the excellence of his worship, Allah had entered Iblis into the company of the angels. But he then returned to his lowly nature, refusing to prostrate as Allah told him to, and becoming proud towards Adam, leading to him becoming a disbeliever. Satan did not stop whispering to them, trying to trick them, until he made them slip and fall by eating from the tree which Allah had told them not to. For this Allah sent them out of the garden, telling them and Satan to go down to the earth, some of them enemies to others, where they would stay and live enjoying the good things there until their lifespan, and until the final hour arrived. Adam received the words given to him by Allah, and was inspired to ask for forgiveness with them. These words of forgiveness are mentioned in Surah Al-Aif, 23, they said, Our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, we will certainly be of the losers. Allah accepted Adam's turning to him and forgave him, for he is always forgiving and merciful towards his creation. Allah told them to go down together from the garden to the earth, and said that when he sends guidance, through the prophets. Those who follow it and have faith in his prophets will have nothing to fear in the world to come, and will not feel sorrow about what passed them by on earth. As for those who disbelieve and deny his signs, they are the people of the fire of hell, who will live there eternally. Al-Baqarah 30-39
Then Allah told Adam, O Adam, go and dwell you and your wife Eve in the paradise and eat from the good things in it, but do not approach and eat from that tree. For if you both eat from that tree after my prohibiting it you would be of those who transgress my limits. Satan told them, Allah has only forbidden you from eating from that tree because he does not want you to become angels or to live eternally in paradise. Satan swore to the two of them saying, By Allah I am to you both, O Adam and Eve, a sincere advisor in what I direct you to. So Satan brought them down from their high position through trickery and deception. When they ate from the tree which they had been forbidden to eat from, their private parts became exposed and visible to them. So they started to fix leaves from paradise onto themselves in order to cover up. Their Lord called to them, Did I not forbid you both from eating from this tree, and did I not warn you that Satan is your clear enemy? Adam and Eve said, O our Lord, we have wronged ourselves by doing what you forbade us from, and surely if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us we will be amongst the losers. Losing our share of the worldly life and hereafter. Allah told Adam, Eve and Satan, Go down from paradise to the earth, where some of you will be enemies of others, and where you would have a place to settle with enjoyment of what is in the earth until an appointed time. Allah addressed Adam and Eve and the descendants, On this earth you will live for the length of time I decree for you, and on this earth you will die. After being buried, you will be taken out from your graves and brought back to life. O children of Adam, Allah made for you clothing, necessary for covering your nakedness, and clothing for you to adorn yourselves with, and the clothing of mindfulness. Which is through following what Allah instructs and staying away from what he has not allowed, which is better than the physical types of clothing. What is mentioned here about clothing is from among the signs of Allah, showing his power over everything, so that perhaps people will remember his blessings to them and be thankful for them. O children of Adam, do not let Satan deceive you by making disobedience look beautiful to you, making you leave covering your nakedness with clothing, or leave the clothing of mindfulness. Do not be deceived as he tricked your parents, making eating from the tree seem good to them, and the result of that was that he got them expelled from paradise. And their nakedness became clear to them. Satan and his tribe watch and see you, and you cannot see or watch them, so always be on your guard against him and his tribe. Allah made the Satan's friends and helpers of those who do not have faith in Allah. As for those who have faith and do good, the Satans have no way against them. If the idolaters commit an indecent act, they defend it, saying they found their fathers doing it and that Allah had commanded them to do it. Tell them, O Muhammad, indeed Allah does not command the wrong, rather, he forbids it, so how can you claim such a thing about him? Or are you, O idolaters, inventing things about Allah, saying what you do not know about him? Say, O Muhammad, indeed Allah commands justice, not indecency or sin. And he commands loyalty to him in worship generally, and particularly in places of worship, that you call on him alone. Sincere in your dedication to him. As he created you from nothing the first time, he will bring you back to life a second time. He who is able to create you in the first place is able to return you and bring you back to life. Allah made people into two groups, one group of them he guided, making it easy for them to find guidance and removing the barriers to it. And another he made go astray from the path of truth, because they made the Satans their friends and helpers instead of Allah, ignorantly becoming bound to them. Considering themselves to be correctly guided to a straight path. O children of Adam, dress beautifully in every place of worship, and eat and drink, but do not be extravagant. Truly, he does not love those who are extravagant. O children of Adam, wear clean, pure, beautiful, clothes that cover your nakedness when you pray and when you make circumambulation of the Kaaba. Eat and drink whatever you like from the good things that Allah has allowed. But do not be extravagant in this, nor go beyond what is allowed. Allah does not love those who go beyond the limits. Olaif 19-31 Cain murders Abel. Genesis the 4th of January 2016 states that Adam and Eve had two sons, i.e. Cain, the elder, and Abel, the younger. Upon reaching maturity, both Cain and Abel offered sacrifices to Allah, but only Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to Allah. Realizing this, Cain was furious and murdered Abel in a rage of anger and frustration. Allah then cursed and punished Cain for his homicidal behavior. The Quran offers an almost identical narration, but with some additional details about Abel's refusal to fight his brother. Cain Relate with the truth, O messenger, to these Jews who are jealous and who do wrong, the incident of the two sons of Adam, Cain and Abel, when they both offered a sacrifice to gain closeness to Allah. Allah accepted the sacrifice offered by Abel because he was mindful of him and did not accept the offering of Cain because he was not mindful of Allah. 
Cain was unhappy about the fact that Abel's sacrifice was accepted and jealously said, I will kill you, O Abel. Abel replied, Allah only accepts the offering of the one who is mindful of him by fulfilling his instructions and avoiding his prohibitions. If you lift your hand intending to kill me, I will not do the same as you. It is not because I am a coward, but because I fear Allah the Lord of all created things. I want you to return with the sin of wrongly killing me, together with your previous sins and become one of those who will enter the fire of hell on the day of judgment and remain there. That is the reward of those who overstep the limits of Allah. I do not want to take on your crime and become one of the sinners. The evil prompting soul of Cain persuaded him to wrongly kill his brother, Abel. So he killed him and because of that he became one of those who are losers in this world and the afterlife. He set a bad example and will therefore bear that burden, as well as the burden of any person who does the same until the day of judgment. Without any reduction in the burden of those who imitate him. Allah sent a crow to dig the earth in front of him to bury another dead crow and teach him how to cover his brother's body. He then became regretful. Regret is the end result of those who commit sins. Due to Cain's murder of his brother, I informed the Israelites that any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people, since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. Whoever refrains from killing a person whose soul I have made sacred, and regards it to be forbidden to kill such a person, it is as if he has given life to all people. Because in such an action lies the safety of all people. My messengers brought to the Israelites clear signs and evidences. Despite this many of them overstepped my limits by committing sins and going against the messengers. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger, and who challenge them by spreading corruption on earth though killing, looting and creating fear on the roads is that they be killed, or crucified, or that they have their alternate hands and feet cut off, and if the offense is repeated the left hands and right feet are to be cut off. Or they are to be exiled. Such punishment is a disgrace for them in the world, and in the afterlife, they will receive a great punishment. Except for those warmongers who repent before you, people of authority, get hold of them. Know, then, that Allah is forgiving and merciful towards them after they repent. Due to his mercy, he overlooks the punishment that is due to them. Almida 27-34 Moses and the Promised Land According to the Bible, Numbers 13.1-14.38 to and Deuteronomy January 19, 1940, Moses and the Israelites, having escaped from Egypt, were directed by Allah to invade and take the land of Palestine. Before beginning their invasion, the Israelites sent out spies into Palestine. Except for Joshua and Caleb, all the other spies reported that a successful invasion was not feasible, since the inhabitants of Palestine were far taller and stronger than the Israelites. Even though Joshua and Caleb urged invasion and reliance upon Allah, the people refused to obey them. At this point, according to Numbers the 13th of November 2012, Allah reportedly threatened to disinherit the Israelites, a punishment that Numbers 13.13 to 14.38 states was only averted by the pleading of Moses to Allah. However, as punishment, the Israelites were forced to continue wandering in the wilderness for 40 years before they were allowed to enter Palestine. A similar description appears in the Quran, but with some greater detail. Remember, O Messenger, when Moses said to his people, the Israelites, O people, remember, with your hearts and tongues. Allah's favor to you when he made prophets amongst you calling you to guidance, made you kings in control of your affairs after you were subjugated slaves, and gave you such favors that he had not given to any other people in your time. Moses said, O people, enter the land that has been purified, Jerusalem and the surrounding area, which Allah has promised that you will enter, and fight the disbelievers in it. Do not become weak before the tyrants, because you will then end up as losers in the world and the afterlife. His people said to him, O Moses, in the holy land there is a powerful and mighty people and this is preventing us from entering it. We will not enter it as long as these people are there, because we do not have the ability to fight them. If they leave, we will go in. Two men from the companions of Moses who feared Allah and were afraid of his punishment, whom Allah had blessed by enabling them to obey him, urged their people to fulfill the instruction of Moses and said, Enter the gate of the city against the tyrants. Once you go through the gate you will, by Allah's permission, defeat them, as Allah's custom is to give victory after the means of having faith and making preparation are adopted. Place your reliance and trust in Allah alone, if you truly have faith.
Faith in Allah requires you to rely on him. The children of Israel insisted on going against the instruction of their prophet, Moses, and said, We will never enter the city as long as the tyrants are there. So you, O Moses, and your Lord go and fight the tyrants. We will remain sitting here and will not join you in the fight. Moses said to his Lord, O Lord, I have no authority over anyone besides myself and my brother, Aaron. So separate us from those who do not obey you and your messenger. Allah said to his prophet Moses, Peace be upon him, Allah has forbidden entry into the Holy Land for the Israelites for a period of forty years, in which they will wander on earth aimlessly without direction. Do not grieve, O Moses, over those who do not follow Allah, because the punishment they receive is because of their sins. Almighty 20-26 However, there is one marked difference between the narration of this incident in the two holy books. While the Quran reports that it was Moses who asked Allah to separate him from the Israelites, the Bible maintains that Moses pled for Allah's forgiveness of the rebellious people, the Israelites, after Allah threatened to disinherit them from his favors. Nonetheless, the biblical and Quranic accounts, in spite of this slight variation, are amazingly similar. The birth of John the Baptist It is not only in the Old Testament that one finds similarities between the Quran and the Bible, there are also similarities between the Quran and the New Testament as well. Parallels between Christianity and Islam Leading up to the birth of John, Yahya in Arabic, the Baptist, as reported in Luke the 1st of February 1924. 57-66 according to this story. Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, were an aged couple, who had never had children Elizabeth being barren. Once. When Zechariah was praying in the sanctuary, the angel Gabriel appeared, and announced to Zechariah that his prayer had been heard and accepted by Allah. Zechariah and Elizabeth were soon to have a son who would be named John, and who would be a prophet to his people. Zechariah asked for a sign to confirm this message regarding the birth of a son. According to the account of Luke, the sign was that Zechariah was made mute, and allegedly remained mute throughout the conception, gestation, birth, and first eight days of John the Baptist. Only upon confirming his wife's choice of the name John for their son, did Zechariah regain his speech. The above account parallels the Quran, which too, speaks of this event. Allah graciously accepted the dedication and brought her up well. He made the hearts of his pious servants incline caringly to her and put her in the care of the prophet Zechariah. Whenever Zechariah would enter her place of worship he would find wholesome food there. So, he asked her, O Mary, where did you get this food from? She replied, This food is from Allah. Allah gives to whomever he wishes in abundance without account. When Zechariah saw the food that Allah was miraculously giving to Mary, he became hopeful that Allah would give him a child despite being very old and his wife being unable to bear children. He said, O Lord, give me a good child. You hear the prayer of the person who prays to you and you know his condition. The angels called out to him while he was standing in prayer in his place of worship, saying, Allah gives you good news of a child to be born to you whose name will be John. He will confirm a word from Allah, which refers to Jesus, son of Mary, because he was specially created by a word from Allah. This child will be a leader of his people with his knowledge and worship. He will be innocent, keeping himself away from desires, including approaching women. He will dedicate himself to worshipping his Lord and will also be a prophet from those who are righteous. When the angels gave him the good news about John, Zechariah said, O Lord, how can I have a child after I have become old and my wife is unable to bear children? Allah replied to him that the example of the creation of John in spite of his old age and his wife being barren, is like that of the creation of anything that Allah wishes to create, even though it is out of the ordinary. This is because Allah has power over everything and does whatever he wills in his wisdom and knowledge. Zechariah said, O Lord, give me a sign that my wife is pregnant. Allah said, The sign that you want is that you will not be able to speak for three days, except by indications, and this will not be because of any disability. So, remember Allah much and glorify him at the end and beginning of the day. Al Imran 37-41 Bearing in mind that Yahya is merely the Arabic name for John, the above passage from the Quran offers impressive similarity to the account reported in Luke. The only significant discrepancy is in regard to the length of time that Zechariah remained mute, which the Quran limits to only three days. The birth of Jesus The biblical account of the angelic announcement to Mary of the coming birth of Jesus is related in Luke January 26, 1938. Skipping over the later theologizing to be found in this passage from Luke, the basic outline is that the angel Gabriel informs Virgin Mary that she has found favor in the sight of Allah. 
and that she will soon give birth to a son who will be named Jesus. In a puzzled state, Mary asks as to how she could possibly give birth when she is still a virgin, to which Gabriel reportedly answers that. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child to be born will be holy, he will be called Son of God. The words attributed to Gabriel in the above quoted passage call to mind the polytheistic Greek myths of the gods descending from Mount Olympus to rape and impregnate mortal women. In contrast to this polytheistic residual as found in Luke, the Quran, while paralleling the account from Luke in most other respects, presents the virgin birth of Jesus as an act of miraculous creation, not as an act of impregnation. Remember, O Messenger, when the angels said to Mary, Peace be upon her, Allah has chosen you because of the praiseworthy qualities you have. He has purified you from all defects and chosen you over all the other women of your time. O Mary, stand for long periods in prayer, prostrate to your Lord and bow down with his righteous servants who bow down to him. The story of Zechariah and Mary is one of the reports of the Gabe Unseen, which are revealed to you, O Messenger. You were not there with those scholars and worshippers when they argued about who was most entitled to raise Mary. They eventually decided to draw lots by throwing their pens and the pen of Zechariah, peace be upon him, one. This child will miraculously speak to people when he is a small baby, as well as when he grows up and becomes a man. He will tell them what is best for them in their religious and worldly affairs. He will also be one of those who are righteous in their words and actions. Mary was surprised that she was to have a child without a husband and said in astonishment, How can I have a child when no man has come near me in a lawful or unlawful way? The angel said to her, Just as Allah will create a child for you without a father, he creates whatever he wishes even though it may be out of the ordinary. When Allah wishes for something, he says, Be, and it is. Nothing can stop him doing as he wills. Remember, O messenger, when the angel said, O Mary, Allah gives you good news of a child who will be created without a father. Merely by a word from Allah, such as be, and he will become a child by Allah's will. The name of this child will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. He will have a high rank in this world and the afterlife and he will be one of those who are made close to Allah. Allah will teach him to say and do things correctly, and he will teach him the Torah that he had revealed to Moses, peace be upon him, and the gospel which he will reveal to him. Allah will make him a messenger to the Israelites, instructing him to say to them, I am Allah's messenger to you. I have brought to you a sign indicating my prophethood, I will make the shape of a bird using clay, then I will breathe into it and it will become a living bird by Allah's permission. I will cure the one who was born blind, so that he will be able to see, and the leper who will recover from his illness, and I will bring the dead to life. I will do all of this with Allah's permission. I will tell you about what you consume and what you hide in your homes. In all of these extraordinary things that I mentioned to you, which human beings cannot do, is a clear sign that I am Allah's messenger to you, if you wish to have faith and to accept the proof. I have come to you to confirm the revelation of the Torah that was before me, and to make lawful some of that which was unlawful in the past, making things easy for you. I have brought to you a clear proof of the truthfulness of what I say, so be mindful of Allah by fulfilling his instructions and avoiding his prohibitions and follow that which I call you to. Allah is my Lord and your Lord, and he is the only one that deserves to be followed and feared. So, worship him alone. This worship of Allah and being mindful of him that I instruct you to do is the straight path which has no crookedness. Al Imran 42-51 Summary and Conclusions There are many more parallels that can be illustrated between the Quran and the Bible. In both books, one finds the story of Noah's Ark and the Flood. In both books, one finds similar and additional stories regarding Moses, e.g., the conflict between Moses and the Pharaoh of Egypt, the story of Moses receiving the covenant at MT. Sinai, etc. Likewise, one finds the story of Joseph, the Israelite vizier of Egypt, which unfolds remarkably and in great detail in the Quran. Furthermore, the Quran tells the story of David's killing of Goliath, the story of King Saul, the story of Abraham's trials, etc. Unfortunately, time and space do not permit that all of these parallel stories between the Quran and the Bible can be individually addressed. However, it is also biblical characters in the Quran. However, it is also the case that the Quran reports numerous stories regarding well-known biblical characters that cannot be found in the Bible. One example of the Quran reporting a story not found in the Bible would be the allusion in the above quoted passage from the Quran to various individuals casting arrows to see who would be charged with the care of Mary during her pregnancy. 
Quite simply, this story is not to be found in the contemporary Bible. Another example would be the passage in the Quran that refers to Jesus fashioning a bird out of clay and then, by Allah's leave, causing that clay bird to come to life. Once again, this story cannot be found anywhere in the modern Bible. Nonetheless, one can see that such stories do find expression in the early Christian literature, most especially in the so-called apocryphal books of the New Testament. As such, these stories illustrate that the Quran is often more consistent with the early roots of Christianity than is modern Christianity itself. Encounters with Early Christianity Graduating from Harvard College in 1971, the author was accepted on scholarship to the Master of Divinity program at the Harvard Divinity School, Harvard University. Having previously obtained his license to preach from the United Methodist Church in 1969, after completion of the first year of a three-year study program at Harvard Divinity School, he was ordained into the deaconate of the United Methodist Church in 1972, and was from that point an ordained minister. There is some irony, as the author mentions, in the fact that the supposedly best brightest and most idealistic of ministers to be are selected for the very best of seminary education, for example, that offered at that time at the Harvard Divinity School, the irony is that with such an education, the seminarian is exposed to a vast knowledge of historical truth such as the formation of the early, mainstream church and how it was shaped by geopolitical considerations. The original reading of various biblical texts, many of which are in sharp contrast to what most Christians read when they pick up their Bible. Although gradually some of this information is being incorporated into newer and better translations of the Bible, the evolution of such concepts as a triune Godhead and the sonship of Jesus. The non-religious considerations that underlie many Christian creeds and doctrines. The existence of those early churches and Christian movements which never accepted the concept of a triune Godhead and which also never accepted the concept of the divinity of Jesus. And those early Christian writings, once regarded as scripture by many early Christian churches, known as the New Testament Apocrypha. Moreover, the information contained therein differed from the information in the canonical New Testament that emerged some centuries later. Dwelling briefly on the subject, one must consider the issue of those early Christian writings not incorporated into the later formation of the New Testament. During the author's summary encounters in tracing the roots of early Christianity, he amazingly discovered that certain specific stories in the Quran, not found in the contemporary Bible, and occasionally even at odds with those contained in the Bible, were preserved and recorded identically in the New Testament Apocrypha. Some examples of such occurrences are enumerated below.